Mm -hmm. right. Okay, so um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the February A3D3 seminar. Um, I'm very pleased today to be able to introduce uh, Professor Chetan Pandarinath, um, who seems has joint appointments at Emory University in Georgia Tech. Um, he's a professor of biomedical engineering and neurosurgery, um, and his research sits at the intersection of neural engineering systems, neuroscience, and artificial intelligence, uh, which aligns very well with the, the neuroscience interests of A3D3. Um, and Chetan will be talking to us today about AI models of population dynamics precisely link state space directories with behavior in the mammalian spinal cord, which is which is a good mouthful. So uh, please take it away, Chetan. Hey, thanks very much, Matthew. I appreciate it. I'm excited to, to chat with everybody today. Um, I should have probably put some more buzzwords in that title. I couldn't, couldn't think of any good ones, but if anybody... Uh, has any, I'll, I'll add them, just let me know. Um, yeah, so I, I'm i going to talk to you guys about um, some recent work where uh, that I'm pretty excited about, where we're using kind of artificial intelligence and machine learning models to um, uncover dynamics from neural population activity in the spinal cord, which is probably a, a system that not many people here are that familiar with. But I'll also... Before I get into that, I'll spend some time kind of going over the, the foundations of this work, so some of the machine learning innovations that are that are really important for it. Um, okay, great. So let's let's go over some some motivation first. Um, this is likely a slide that that many of you have already seen before, but um, our ability to interface with the brain is changing pretty rapidly. So this is a plot showing um, from Ian Stevenson and Conrad Cording where they looked at the number of neurons people recorded, uh, reported being able to simultaneously record. Uh, and you can see that this trend has steadily increased over time. But importantly, this uh, y-axis is a log scale, right? So um, uh, this is clear, this is exponential growth. And maybe recently, I don't, I don't have kind of the last couple of years on here, but we're probably above this line. Um, so yeah, doubling times of about every six years. So we're really, you know, kind of in a different world now with neural recordings, being able to monitor the brain, like thousands of neurons than we were, you know, just a, just a couple of decades ago, um, where, you know, when I was getting my PhD, recording from 100 neurons simultaneously was quite an accomplishment. Okay, so um, our recording capacity is really doubling about every six years. And what this means is, you know, what, what worked in the past to analyze and interpret neural data when we had just a handful of neurons is probably a little outdated. We need new analytical frameworks in order to interpret these kind of large scale data sets. Um, and just to, to kind of put everybody on the same page, I wanted to make sure um, people had a concept of, of what we're talking about when we're talking about recording neural activity. So typically there, there are various ways of, of doing it, but I, I'm going to be talking about spiking activity or action potentials, which are recorded from implanted electrode arrays. So this is an example of a Utah array. You can kind of see a thumb in the background here for scale. It's very small. This is like four by four millimeters. Um, and each one of these little tines here is uh, an electrode, so it can pick up voltages. Um, and usually that means it'll uh, allow us to see kind of neurons that are very close to it. So here's an example of a recording from 100 electrodes while a monkey is moving its uh, arm around. And you see these little, you know, voltage blips on different uh, electrodes. So here we're just plotting anytime the voltage gets below a certain value, we just plot it, plot the waveform. But the, the key point here is that you know each of those is an action potential. So that's like one neuron sending a message to other neurons in the network. So hopefully um, everybody's on the same page. But typically the data that I'll be talking about today, you know, for neural recordings, are these action potential uh, potentials that indicate kind of when a neuron is sending a message to, to other neurons. So high level, what we're gonna talk about is kind of a uh, scientific understanding 
of neural population activity that sort of um, emerged or evolved, especially in the last 10 to 15 years. And then I'll show you how artificial intelligence or machine learning methods allow us to um, precisely infer the dynamics of large neural populations. And then I'll show you some applications of that in, in, uh, in data taken from the mammalian spinal cord, which is, um, I'll, I'll talk about why it's kind of an amazing system, but it's a key opportunity to really kind of test how precise our models of neural population dynamics really are. Okay, so let's start here. So what do I mean by population dynamics? So, you know, when we're talking about a neural circuit, which is um, a whole bunch of neurons, and, and in this schematic, I maybe have 20 or 30 or something, but uh, if we're talking about, you know, motor cortex, which is what uh, typically is uh, responsible for a lot of control of your arm and hand movements, we're talking about millions of neurons. Um, and so, you know, we have we have this population of neurons, and remember these little action potentials are neurons sending messages to each other, and we monitor them over time. And that's a kind of very high dimensional representation. And what we what I kind of uh, state is, is you know, population dynamics, this this abstract notion that I'm talking about, provides a way of summarizing the activity of a network. So finding lower dimensional, uh, what we call latent representations of the population's activity. Um, and we might actually even have equations that we can use to interpret the activity of the population. So let me break that down a little bit. So, you know, in general, we're recording this kind of high dimensional activity, you know, hundreds, thousands of, of neurons um, over time, and we want some way of, of summarizing and interpreting that activity. So let's imagine we're recording from three neurons, and instead of plotting that spiking activity that I've been talking about, I've kind of smoothed it here. So um, now we have the smoothed activity of three different uh, three different neurons. Um, we can think about a state space representation of this activity. Um, and that's very common in physics and in engineering, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, let's imagine that we thought of the activity of an individual neuron as one axis on our state space plot. So we have three neurons, we have a three-dimensional uh, plot, and then the activity of the system at any given point in time is represented as a point in our state space. So what we've been finding kind of repeatedly uh, over the last couple of decades as we've had these like large scale population recordings is that, you know, the activity um, of, of our neurons doesn't kind of span this space uniformly, but rather it's often restricted to lower dimensional subspaces or manifolds within our high dimensional space. So if I looked at this activity and just like at every point in time, I kind of plotted a point for where activity uh, is where is that in our state space? We find that like, you know, you could do this for a long period of time and you would not find it kind of take up the entire volume of this cube, but rather we often see that um, the changes in the neurons firing rates are coordinated so that like maybe a lower dimensional, as so in this case, what's lower than three, a two dimensional plane would capture, you know, kind of the structure of the neural firing rates that we observe over time. Um, so that's one kind of way in which the you know the activity is kind of uh, like heavily structured. But we also find that not just kind of this uh, kind of spatial like these coordination patterns, but also activity seems to evolve in these lower dimensional subspaces or manifolds in very stereotyped ways. So it's not just randomly zipping around here, but there's a lot of temporal structure to how um, uh, activity evolves. And so this is what, when I'm talking about dynamics in this talk, what I'm referring to are kind of like how activity evolves over time in these latent spaces. Um, and if we were going to describe this by an equation, you know, we could think of um, uh, autonomous dynamics here would mean the change in the system state as a function of time is some function of the current state. So the equation that describes that is on the left here, and this vector field is basically saying just that. So if you kind of know uh, where you are in your state space, where are you likely to go in the next point of 
uh, in time. That's what we call dynamics. And I'll just briefly pause here to make sure you know, if folks have, uh, this is obviously just very high level conceptual, but um, if folks have any questions, feel free to speak up. Okay, so let me show you kind of a concrete example of where we observed um, signatures of these neural population dynamics. So in this experiment um, that was published a few years ago now, um, Churchland and Cunningham looked at the activity um, from, from a monkey's brain, so motor cortical activity, they're looking at about 200 neurons, as a monkey was trained to make um, uh, various types of reaches. So this is a specific kind of task that we call a delayed reaching task. And what that means is the monkey is trained so that a target is gonna come on the screen. And then the monkey knows, okay, I, I see the target, but I'm not supposed to actually move until I get a separate cue, which we call the go cue. So um, here's an example of one condition in this task. And you see like a target is on the screen. They actually have like a virtual maze with barriers to force the monkey like in this case, it can't just reach straight up, but it actually has to reach kind of around and to the right. Um, but it has this period where it's preparing to move. And then separately, a go cue will, will uh, be presented. And that's when the monkey actually moves uh, its arm to, to get to the target. And then it does that, it gets its reward, and then goes on to the next target. Um, so, But the key, key thing we're going to look at is the relationship between what's going on in the brain during this preparatory period and then what happens after the monkey gets that go cue and we see this kind of execution? What, what does the change look like in the brain? So um, bear with me for a second. Let's break down kind of how this these data and how they're processed. Um, so here, uh, you know, we have a bunch of different conditions. So I showed you one of like the monkey reaching up in this kind of curved trajectory. And that would be, I don't know, one, one of the traces here, perhaps. Um, and there are a lot of other conditions, so they can get the monkey to make some straight reaches, some curved reaches, a hundred different conditions. And then the data that we're looking at, remember we're looking at action potential, so spiking activity from neurons um, as a function of time. And here I've just, you know, colored them, like we have a bunch of different trials, so I've colored them by which of these conditions was the monkey reaching in. So this is kind of like what the monkey's hand was doing, and this is what neural activity was doing on different trials. So uh, for this paper that I'm talking about, the way they processed this data was to take all trials of a given condition and group them, and then tr average across those repeated trials for a given condition. So you get something that looks kind of like this. So now for each condition, you have this time varying firing rate for each of your neurons. So you have you know, neurons by time and then uh, one of these for each of your conditions. And they, they took this activity and they applied pretty simple dimensionality reduction methods to visualize this activity in that lower dimensional state space that uh, I was talking about. So at the level of the neurons, they had 200 neurons, so that's a 200 dimensional, um, uh, I guess, neural population state, but then they applied dimensionality reduction to get down to a lower dimensional representation. So let me just first show you what it looked like when they visualized this activity in a reduced dimensional space. So this is what they found. So remember on the left here is what the monkey's hand was doing. And on the right here is what was happening in the brain. So in, the, in that reduced dimensional space. So the dots represent what is the state of the neural activity just before the monkey gets that go cue. So just before it starts to execute the movement. And each one of these traces tells you what happens to the neural population activity as the monkey executes the movement. Okay, so uh, there's one trace here for every trace here. So like, for example, this, this trace would say like, um, for the condition where the monkey is, I don't know, reaching down into the right, let's say in this curve reach, at the time of preparation, the neural activity was here. And then as the monkey executes the movement, this is how neural activity evolved. And the key takeaway here is that there's this very stereotyped relationship uh, between what activity was doing before the monkey began the movement and what happened as the monkey executed this movement. And it's kind of these very simple rotational dynamics. 
um, that are, seem to be consistent regardless of the specific movement the monkey was making. Um, so, you know, if you kind of know where activity was and you know this vector field, you can say what's going to happen over time. And I should mention, this is a really, really simplified view of the activity. So this is these are 200 neurons. It's like a 200-dimensional space. Um, and obviously, if we had more neurons, it would be even more uh, a higher dimensional. But And I'm only showing you two. So obviously, you know that things have been thrown away. But this is meant to just be kind of a conceptual example of this structure that exists in the neural activity that we might not have predicted would be there. Um, because the monkey is doing a wide variety of things with its hand, and yet the neural activity is doing something very, very stereotyped um, in these low dimensional spaces. Okay, so um, with that, I mean, that's just kind of conceptually what we're talking about when we talk about population dynamics. What I want to show you is how um, artificial intelligence methods can allow us to accurately infer population dynamics and uh, decode movements. Um, so I'll just back up for a second. I kind of showed you this process of taking, uh, you know, they make measurements as the monkey makes repeated uh, movements of the same behavior, and then they kind of average activity across repeated instances of the same trial. Um, so uh, if any of the, if any folks in this group are, you know, interested in things like brain computer interfaces, which I'm sure there are, are quite a few of you, um, then you know that this isn't a great way to process data uh, if you if you want to drive a brain computer interface, like if you want to have a robot that can replicate what the hand is doing here. Um, meaning we don't want to make 20 attempted movements of the same type before we're able to move a robot one time. You know, that's not a feasible way of processing these data. And I guess for folks in general who think about kind of latency uh, in, in applications, we want to be able to uncover these representations uh, in real time. And that can't happen if you have to you know, do the same movement repeatedly. OK, so let me show you like, kind of how we're able to do that using, uh, using recurrent neural networks. So the key idea here, let's take as a given that for each one of these trials, so they're colored by condition, but on a single trial basis, there's some structure in our latent space, so some kind of time-varying trajectory that corresponds to each one of those trials. So the green trials correspond to these trajectories here, uh, the black trials correspond to these, and the red trials correspond to these. So how would we uh, construct a system to be able to infer these on individual trials? So the first thing is we want the system to be able to uh, take the activity and estimate the initial state, right? Those dots, the starting points. And then we also want the system to model the dynamics, that vector field. And if we have those two things, if you have an initial state and you have dynamics, you should be able to kind of integrate along the vector field and be able to estimate the time varying trajectories here, right? So what that means uh, is, you know, we're going to have a system where. Um, for any, any given trial corresponds to one initial state. And then there's one set of dynamics that we're trying to learn that um, corresponds to, that, that's constant, right, for all trials. And with that, that should be enough to infer kind of these underlying trajectories on single trials. So the way we're doing this is uh, a neural network architecture that's likely very familiar to, to people here, um, known as an autoencoder. An autoencoder is a pair of neural networks that are trained together to find a compressed representation of, of uh, your, your data. So let's imagine that you had you know, a, a four, four dimensions of neural activity, and you want to compress that down to one dimension. So you, you train a pair of networks. One network is called the encoder, which just goes from four down, you know, takes in four uh, numbers and outputs one. And the second network is a decoder, which takes in that one number and tries to re reconstruct the original data. So the, the key thing here is that the network is trained to kind of maximize uh, reconstruction accuracy, given that you have like a lower dimensional uh, uh, bottleneck here, right? 
So this allows you know, these two networks to find a compressed representation of the data that allows it to best be reconstructed. And that compression is going to force the network to preserve things that are important while discarding things that are unimportant, like, like noise or things that are just not useful for reconstructing um, activity. So um, we're going to do that as well with an autoencoder. But as I've mentioned, you know, we really care about this structure in time, those uh, dynamics that uh, describe how activity evolves over time. Um, so a lot of times you'll see um, uh, autoencoders that are made with like feed forward networks, like multi-layers perceptrons um, or something like that. Uh, those would not really model temporal structure to the degree we want. So we're going to use um, recurrent neural. So the same basic idea here, but we're going to use recurrent neural networks that take in our data. So um, single trial data, um, neurons, uh, over t activity of neurons over time. We'll have one recurrent neural network that takes in the data and outputs just a vector. So for a given trial here, we'll output a corresponding vector. And then the second network that takes in that vector and tries to reproduce the time varying activity. Um, so for each neuron, it's trying to predict an underlying firing rate that's consistent with the observed spiking activity. And the goal is that by forcing this kind of specific structure where the network is given an initial state and has to learn to predict the entire time varying um, sequence here, um, this network is forced to learn to approximate the dynamics of the system that's under observation. Uh, minor, uh, the cost function here. So we're not trying to uh, reproduce the spiking activity exactly because we think that some of that information is actually, you know, kind of noise or variability that we don't want to model. Instead, we're going to, um, for each neuron, try to predict um, a firing rate, um, so like a smooth function that's consistent with the spiking activity and maximize kind of the Poisson likelihood of um, that of that spiking activity. So, um, and just some high-level points, these recurrent neural networks are nonlinear dynamical systems. So, you know, they're a, a reasonable choice for trying to approximate the dynamics of a system. And um, these, ne these networks are initialized completely randomly. So uh, when you first initialize the networks, they're, you know, completely outputting garbage here at the output. But then um, they're adjusted over the course of model training. Uh, the, the weights, the recurrent weights of this network are adjusted to try to better approximate, uh, uh, you know, create more accurate output and thus better approximate the dynamics of the system that we care about. So just to show you kind of how well that worked, you know, I showed you before these state space trajectories that they got by trial averaging the data. Um, with our system, we're able to recover very similar state space trajectories, but now on a single trial basis. So what I'm showing you here, this is like um, the, there are 2,000 traces here. Each one of them corresponds to a single movement that the monkey was making. Um, and we didn't tell the system anything about the dynamics we expected to see. So we didn't you know, give it any sort of prior that said, find those rotational dynamics. Um, we just kind of threw in the spiking data and asked it to kind of uncover some dynamical structure and said, all right, what, what should come out and or what came out? And that's what we see here. Um, and so this is a nice kind of pretty visualization of the activity. But um, is this really useful for anything? Well, one thing we can test is, you know, we're recording from motor cortex as this monkey is making all these reaching movements. We can say, how well can we predict the specifics of the reaching movement given the you know different representations, including this kind of denoise representation inferred by our method by LFATS. And so first we start by using kind of standard methods for either uh, pre-processing data, which is smoothing, or using a dimensionality reduction method known as, known as Gaussian process factor analysis. And we found that we can predict about 70% of the variance of the monkey's hand movement. Um, based on, you know, the 200 recorded neurons. But if all we do instead is first pre-process the data with our method, we're able to now predict about 90% of the variance of the, um, of the hands velocities. So I think that the, there are two kind of key kind of contributions of this work. 
One is just like kind of the technical contribution. This is a framework for inferring uh, high fidelity uh, dynamics on individual trials. So rather than having to average across a bunch of repeats, um, we can now do this on a single trial basis. And then a scientific um, framework, and, and maybe this is kind of a hypothesis, I guess, that came out of this work, is that maybe like you often see this idea of neural population dynamics being used to visualize data. Like, okay, it's a real kind of useful summary if I'm trying to interpret my data. But this is saying that maybe dynamics can go beyond visualization. And maybe they're, you know, able to tell us, you know, something about what the network is doing very precisely. So like on a single trial basis and on a millisecond time scale. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about um, our approach and how we can apply it to data that are non-autonomous. So I told you about like cases where you know activity is highly predictable based on previous activity. That can't kind of work for every case because if neural systems work that way, where activity was completely predictable based on the past, we wouldn't be able to respond to anything. We wouldn't be able to you know kind of um, handle uncertainty or even just stimuli in general, we'd just be kind of like in a loop. Um, so what about cases where activity is not autonomous? So let's imagine that you see, you know, you've modeled the dynamics of a system and you see that activity is following along what you would have predicted it would do until it doesn't. Um, and then there are cases where activity doesn't do what you'd expect. So from this kind of dynamical systems framework, we'd consider this to be um, a case where there's been an input to the system, where something kind of unpredictable happened and the system is responding to that. So we want to modify our method to be able to handle, so not just um, kind of autonomous dynamics where state change is predict, uh, predicted completely based on current state, but also based on any inputs that may have occurred. So we want to be able to infer the presence of such inputs. So here's an example. Um, this is uh, a case where we might see non-autonomous dynamics where um, a monkey was trained to make reaching movements. So just in a simple kind of schematic, you know, the monkey's here and here's the target. And in most of the trials, the monkey reaches and nothing kind of unexpected happens. But then on some small fraction of the trials, as the monkey is reaching with its arm, we're going to perturb the relationship between where the cursor on the screen is and where it, uh, its arm is. And um, that's going to cause the monkey to have to correct, right? So the monkey's reaching, there's this perturbation. And so the monkey has to kind of dynamically respond to this unexpected perturbation. Um, and so now we have multiple types of trials. Um, you know, in, in this, I, I'm simplifying the behavior, but let's imagine there were only three conditions. Then we have, you know, reach up, reach up and get perturbed to the right, and then reach up and get perturbed to the left. So if the system were completely autonomous, the monkey really wouldn't be able to correct. Uh, you know, once it starts moving, then it's unable to kind of change its course. So if the neural activity were completely, um, sorry, uh, completely dictated. Uh, its evolution were dictated by autonomous dynamics. You just see the same thing for all three of these cases. That's clearly not what happens. You know, the monkey is able to move its arm, and we see a difference in the neural activity. Um, so we know that at the time of perturbation, something's going to happen to neural activity. So what we want now is a system that, again, can take single trial spiking activity, can infer those initial states, can model dynamics, and then it can also infer kind of any inputs that may have occurred. So these, these inputs are, are unknown. And I'll just summarize kind of there, there's some very uh, straightforward architecture changes that we have to do to um, allow the system to be able to respond to inputs and to be able to infer the presence of those inputs. Um, and I'll just kind of quickly summarize the results here. Um, you know, there's a lot more detail, obviously, in, in the paper. But um, here, for three of those conditions, I'm just showing you the input that's inferred by the network. So it doesn't know which of these trials uh, had perturbations on them, which of them are unperturbed, et cetera. But we found, um, you know, the system is able to, uh, for, for trials where there was no perturbation, the system is inferring relatively flat inputs. 
for trials where the monkey's arm was perturbed to the left. Soon after the time of perturbation, it infers like a large deflection. Um, when the monkey's arm is deferred to, uh, sorry, uh, perturbed to the right, it uh, infers an input kind of in the other direction. So what this means is that the system, oh, I'll just show you kind of uh, re uh, reduced dimensional view of the uh, inferred inputs. Um, what this means is that the system is able to not only tell whether a perturbation has happened, but it's able to guess roughly kind of the timing of perturbation and uh, the identity of those perturbations. So in this case, like, is it to the left or to the right? And so I've shown you this in the context of kind of like movement-related activity, um, where the system can infer unexpected events like um, uh, task inputs or perturbations. Uh, the system can also infer kind of sensory feedback or kind of the influence of cognitive processes that might have a top-down influence on activity. But this, this general framework of having a dynamical system that can be influenced by inputs, I mean, it's super general. It can apply to really any, any system. So you can imagine a sensory computation where there are actual sem sensory inputs, there are top-down influences like attention um, on the population's activity, or there are things like internal models or predictive coding that could also be influencing the population's activity. So with, with that work and then more, more recent work where we kind of um, did a lot of hyperparameter optimization that I'm not gonna not to talk not gonna talk to you about. Um, we showed that this approach can be applied to quite a variety of neural systems. So maybe I'll I'll pause there for just a minute before um, kind of moving on and kind of concluding the talk with applications to spinal uh, data. Okay, no questions, yes. Um, great, so, so I think, you know, what I showed you was that um, neural population uh, activity in, in motor cortex um, can be kind of related to, to behavior. And motor cortex is one of the places we're commonly studying population dynamics, but um, there's some challenges with this. Um, so one is that, you know, if we think about how a system is producing output, well, motor cortex is anatomically fairly far removed from the actual output of the motor system, which are spinal and motor neurons whose um, activity is actually what drives our muscles. And so it's hard to precisely monitor the actual output of motor cortex, which are like descending pathways to the brain and spine. So if we really want to precisely say kind of it's also kind of hard to precisely relate population dynamics to behavior. So things like like muscle activity or, or um, moment by moment details of behavior. So if we really want to precisely ask like how do dynamics drive behaviors, motor cortex isn't necessarily the ideal uh, system for that. An alternate system is the spinal cord. So um, Spinal cord uh, is kind of the place where all your motor neurons live that are going to actually output to muscles. And um, how this process happening, so uh, how this process happens, pattern generation in the spinal cord is actually one of the oldest study topics in motor neuroscience. Um, one thing that's that's pretty interesting is so this is these are going to be some videos. Sorry, let me make sure sharing is optimized for video. Okay. These are videos um, as uh, of what's called a decerebrated cat. So this is a cat that where the connection between the brain and spine has actually you know been uh, interrupted. And what we see is that you put the cat on a treadmill, and you know you just the treadmill is moving, and even though there's no kind of descending input from the brain. The spinal cord in isolation is able to kind of generate patterns of activity to keep the legs moving on this treadmill. And we see that during trotting also and during galloping. This is kind of a really well-known um, experiment that kind of showed uh, that the spinal cord in isolation is capable of this, of these, uh, of pattern generation and also generation of quite a few kind of complex 
patterns, like what a diversity of patterns. And so there's a class of neurons um, in the spinal cord called interneurons that seem to be critical for this pattern generation process. So these spinal interneurons, um, it, this is just a, a schematic of the spinal cord where you know these neurons here are what we call interneurons. Um, they connect to motor neurons, which actually send signals to muscles, and then they also receive kind of afferent feedback. Um, but there, one really nice thing is that you know, kind of the outputs and the inputs of the system are really well defined. Um, so I've already showed you how we can estimate pattern, you know, population dynamics in the system that we think are kind of really precise. But now we have the ability to know exactly what kind of the output of a circuit is and ask like, well, how precise are these dynamics that we've estimated? And um, this idea of estimating dynamics in spinal populations was um, kind of uh, broached in this recent uh, Nature paper. And they showed kind of if you take spinal population activity and apply some very simple kind of dimensionality reduction approaches, you can see, you know, kind of cyclic patterns in the activity, um, which is maybe probably what you'd expect from, uh, you know, a very rhythmic activity, like in this case, it's a, a scratching behavior from a turtle um, that you'd expect kind of cyclic patterns in an underlying state space. So we showed, I, you know, I, I showed you that um, we're able to infer these patterns of, of dynamics on a single trial basis. So now we're going to apply that to spinal activity. So first we use kind of the method that, that they used in that in that nature paper. And we see uh, we're looking at spinal interneuron activity and we see very similar kind of rotational patterns. I think that's a, you know, a nice confirmation. It's, it's probably what you'd expect. Um, but in their case, they're kind of only looking at the slowest changing features of the population. As we use these AI tools to kind of increase our temporal resolution, our picture starts to change a little bit. We start to see more features beyond just kind of planar rotations in the in the population's activity. So, you know, um, we're seeing kind of more structure than than was there before. What does that structure um, actually mean? So, I'll just very quickly show you an example. Um, one of the behaviors, uh, the, the behavior here, we're recording from uh, the spine in cats that have been uh, spinalized. So like the cat I showed you on the treadmills, instead we're doing what's called air stepping. Um, I didn't collect this data, it's not from my lab. Um, and so we have two electrode arrays at different levels of, of one side of the spinal cord. And then at the same time, we're able to record the output of the circuit very precisely, which is muscle activity. So there's um, uh, intramuscular uh, electrode arrays, uh, sorry, electrodes, a recording from four extensor muscles and three flexor muscles. Okay, so let's see if these kind of pictures that we get of the population's act activity kind of precisely correspond to muscle activity. Um, I'm gonna skip over some slides here for uh, the sake of time. Okay, so first let's just look at the muscle activity itself. Um, we're looking at, uh, I'm just going to focus in on an extensor muscle, the biceps femoris anterior. And here, this is single trial muscle activity. If you kind of denoise it with, with our uh, uh, machine learning methods. And we're just sorting the trials based on how long was the step. And so some, sometimes, you know, there's a lot of variability in cycles. Um, so sometimes it was a very short step, so like 200 milliseconds. Sometimes it was a very long step, so about um, almost 800 milliseconds. Um, and you can see kind of quite a bit of variability in the muscle's activity and a kind of a clear organization as you go from the shorter trials to the longer trials. If we look at what, um, here I'm just taking, I'm grouped that activity and colored it. So, you know, purple are the shortest trials. Yellow are the longest trials, kind of the, here's the average activity of the muscle. And then we can compare that to what spinal activity, the activity of individual neurons looks like. And we see a lot of activity. Some of it like shows kind of muscle-like features. Some of it shows features that are not muscle-like. Um, and there's kind of 
uh, if you looked at any given level of the spinal cord, you see kind of a diversity of responses. Um, but if instead we start to visualize the those low dimensional trajectories that we've inferred through our machine learning methods, let me see here. Um, this is what we get. So here I've taken these trajectories and colored by the phase of locomotion. So we're talking about in, in locomotion, we're alternating between extensor muscle activation and flexor activation. And here it's just colored by what phase you're in. And you see kind of very uh, kind of regional organization to um, the, the structure that's inferred from the inter, from interneuron activity. Um, and so if these kind of pictures of the interneurons activity really do precisely relate to behavior, then we should be able to measure that. So we just did something very simple, which is take the three-dimensional activity here, draw a plane in the underlying state space, and just said, like, from when the extensor muscle starts to turn on, let's time how long it takes to get to the point, uh, to get to this plane. And how does that correspond to how long the extensor muscle itself was on? And what we see, you know, there aren't many times in neuroscience where I see things with this high of a correlation, but just, you know, um, to unpack this, what I'm saying is like the measurement we're making from the neural population activity very, very precisely corresponds to the measurement we're making at the level of muscles. So um, on the time scale of milliseconds with a very, very high uh, correlation. So precise within tens of milliseconds. And then, um, I'll, so as I mentioned, the, the muscle is on for quite a variety of times. So like between the 200-ish milliseconds to 700 milliseconds. And we wanted to ask like, how is, how is that variety uh, reflected in population dynamics? So here I'm gonna show you single trial trajectories from uh, short uh, trials, or sorry, long trials where the extensor muscle is on for a long period of time. And these are short trials where the extensor muscle is, is on for a very short period of time. And so what you'll see is that there's a period in, uh, sorry, a location in state space that the activity pauses in and the extensor muscle will stay on while the activity is paused in that uh, location. So here are the long trials and you see kind of activity pause and then move on. Here are short trials and you see activity very briefly, there's a blip there and then it moves on. So. All this is to say, like these pretty pictures of population activity that we get from our, our AI tools seem to very precisely correspond to the output produced by the circuit. And I'm going to stop there in the interest of time so that we can take questions. Um, but yeah, happy to answer any questions that folks have. Thanks. Great. Thanks very much, Shetan. That was a very interesting talk. Um, let's open it to the floor. For questions, if people want to put their hand up, or just jump in. So let me ask a question. Um, so the um, the pause you're seeing in the neural space representation on the and that long versus short. I mean, that's an indication that the neurons themselves are, so, are sort of in some holding state before they then go through another burst of activity, whereas the muscle is continually engaged. Would that be the interpretation in, in terms of what the biosystem is actually doing? Yeah, I think that's right. Exactly. So I think, um, you know, when we look at the activity at the level of the individual neurons, it's kind of hard to tell that there's like a state that corresponds to a holding pattern. But when we just do this kind of like simple summary of the population's activity, but you know, first kind of pass it through the machine learning method, and all we're doing is plotting the top three principal components of the activity, we see like something that's very interpretable there in the trajectory. Yeah. Right. Which is like these trajectories found in an unsupervised way, they kind of sit here in space. And then if you look at what's happening in the muscle, at that same time, the muscle is kind of on for that same period of time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder what that means at the level of the individual neural in, there, in terms of activity. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Probably that state is somehow maintained by kind of recurrent interactions yeah. in, in the circuit itself. Yeah. 
So, uh, Melissa. Hi, thanks for this very uh, interesting talk. I was wondering, so um, also about the the time series, like uh, spine cord data, is that from one animal or how many animals? Um, like, is do you know that that's universal? Like, have you checked across multiple individuals, whether it's the same behavior across yeah. great, multiple great individuals? Um, so yes, so we've at least, um, I think I show like, data from two cats on this slide. So these are, yeah, two individuals. We have a third also where it was very similar. Um, so yeah, that, that's nice and reassuring that this kind of feature or mechanism seems to be kind of consistent across individuals, yeah. And um, is there any, like, I, I saw you also had a turtle like is there is it consistent across species or is it have you only looked at it for cats just that's a really good question curiosity. we so the turtle data was from from a different lab um and we have we haven't been able to look at that data yet we're starting to look at um, mouse um which is nice because you know if we can kind of replicate these findings in mouse then we also have all the nice tools you have when you're working with a mouse like genetics and and um, other sorts of things that would allow us to really kind of probe kind of the underlying circuit me mechanisms that are that are mediating this activity. But yeah, great great question. We're hoping to expand to other species soon. Thanks. Thank you. I'll ask another one actually along the similar yeah. that Melissa's saying. So I mean the difference between it's interesting that you see maybe a commonality of activity between the turtle and the between the, the reptilian brain and the mammalian brain. And is that maybe hinting that there are some fundamental neural circuits that are uh, underpinning those sorts of, of behaviors? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I I think so, if I'm able to, <laughs> you know, slightly take off my scientist hat for a second because I like making statements that I can back by data and I, you know, can't necessarily. But, you know, um, locomotion or a lot of these like kind of cyclic behaviors are pretty common, right, across um, animals. And the challenge that the circuit is trying to solve is pretty well preserved, right? It's like coordinate the movements of these four limbs. Uh, yeah, if we were looking at like an insect that maybe has like, you know, six limbs, maybe things might look a little bit different, but I think what, what I'm hoping that we're getting at here is um, a little bit of like the, sorry, let me just pull this up for a second. Um, nope, that didn't work. Sorry. Okay, so like what I think we're we're trying to get at here is like, Here's an abstract representation of what the system is doing. And, you know, I think it's kind of foolhardy to try to compare individual neurons, like, you know, across animals or across species. But maybe as you're saying, like, th these abstract representations give us a signature that we can try to look for, like, commonality across species. And, like, I think what we're seeing is, like, you know, there's this pattern that happens when you kick off the extensor muscle. Is that going to be similar across species. There's this kind of thing that's common across locomotion, which is that not every step is the same length and you need to dynamically adjust how long the muscle is on. Are the kind of neural circuit mechanisms that are able to do that, are those going to be consistent across species? I think those are exactly the types of questions that we'd be able to ask. That's, that's really interesting. Um, at least from my perspective as an astronomer, that's really interesting. That's <laughs> <laughs> a commonality yeah. of control system. Um, yeah. Okay. Do we have any other questions for Chatton? Um, maybe just building off of that, um, and Please, in part because I I know some of your other work, Chatton. Could you comment a little bit on sort of one of the common challenges in neuroscience is that even though we believe there's these shaman, common computations, that the measurements we make are really different, right across different, um, even within, not even thinking about across species, right, but even, you know, for a given experiment, 
you know, you often are putting your sensor in, making measurements, then taking it out, putting it back in, et cetera. So can you kind of comment on how these tools are useful for dealing with those kinds of issues? Yeah, right. Thanks, Amy. That's a great, great point and a great question. So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that was at first surprising and now it makes sense more than I thought about it. Now it's just reassuring is that, you know, these pictures of population activity that we see are typically not specific to this, the neurons that we record from, right? So, you know, we can record from neurons over here and then these neurons that are like adjacent to them and they'll have very, very similar patterns. So it's like a nice summary of the population's activity that's, that's typically kind of independent of the specific neurons in the circuit. And similarly, like, I don't show it, but one of the things we often do to verify these types of representations is, is hold out some set of neurons that was simultaneously recorded and say, how well can these representations predict those other neurons? Um, and that actually works quite well. Um, so, you know, it tells us what we're latching onto is kind of this distributed kind of property of the network rather than kind of idiosyncrasies of any individual neuron. And then, you know, I think what we'd like to do is take this a little further. So, you know, I talked about training these recurrent neural networks to model the dynamics of a system. Well, now we have a trained recurrent neural network, which we hope is like an in silico model of the biological neural circuit. Can we probe the properties of that system and use like dynamical systems analysis tools like fixed point analyses or like studying these, these flow fields? Um, because I think you know those are kind of like summaries of these abstract representations that might we might be able to say like are common across subjects, right? Like two two monkeys or something might have very similar fixed point structure to their dynamics, whereas it's hard to like know what to compare out of like individual neuron representations. Is that kind of what you were getting at? Amy? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, if there's no more, let's thank Chitlin again um, for a very interesting talk. This has been great. Um, and next month's talk will be uh, David Hogg. And I'll be... uh, hey, uh, I have a question for oh, yes, Professor. Please. I don't know if, if I may ask. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, so um, um, in, in Elfast, um, uh, the, the, the model of Elfast is uh, using the uh, uh, variation autoencoder, right? And I, I um, in, in your presentation, I think uh, I, I get the idea of why we should have a um, encoder decoder uh, structure, but um, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering why would we need the variation uh, or variational part in there? Why wouldn't we just use the the normal uh, autoencoder. Thank you. Yeah, that's a that's a really great question. So um, we have this autoencoder structure. There is kind of this bottleneck here, which is um, a limited number, you know, limited dimensionality between uh, the encoder and the decoder or generator, as we call it here. Um, and I think what you're pointing out is like I didn't talk about it in the talk, but it's in, in our model. This is variational, meaning it's not just that this network outputs a single vector, but it actually um, produces a mean and a variance for each dimension. And then this other network doesn't get those numbers, it gets a sample from that you know, mean and variance. Um, I think you could do it without that. I, you know, I'm not like completely convinced that variational is the only way to do this. I think one nice property of variational is that it, you could think of it as like an information bottleneck meaning um, instead of just passing things directly, you're passing a distribution and you're sampling from that, which kind of adds some noise and serves as like a regularizer in the, in the system. So that, you know, in the limit, you can imagine if I gave the system enough capacity here in this bottleneck, it could literally memorize the pattern of spikes here at the input and predict that same, you know, encode all of that information here and then this other network could just regenerate that exact pattern of spikes, and that would be the best possible thing you could do to reconstruct the data. It would be it would be useless, but it would be like the best possible thing you could do. And so I think the variational approach is just one way of forcing this to actually be a bottleneck, forcing some compression here, and uh, making it discard variability that is not as important for reconstructing the data. Does that make sense? <laughs>
Yes, yes, yes. Thanks. Uh, very clear. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Great question. Okay. So uh, thanks everyone. Uh, next month will be David Hogg. Um, that'll be the same the the second Monday in March. Uh, so look out for the adverts for that. And again, we thank today's speaker for his excellent talk. Awesome. Thank you all so much for the invite. Thanks. It was a lot of fun.